Well, good afternoon, uh, everyone. And uh, thank you for joining us for the uh, SimQuick Coalition meeting. Uh, it's a beautiful day. And I know folks might like to be elsewhere because it's such a beautiful day, but we'll be uh, finished in plenty of time for you to enjoy the rest of the day. So thank you for coming. Uh, we do have a uh, content filled meeting today uh, with lots of very important information. As you know, everything is moving very fast uh, right now and uh, we're getting even faster as more information comes in, you know, whether it has to do with the uh, COVID responses to that, uh, the crisis, the civil unrest crisis that we're facing, uh, not to mention uh, just our lives in general and all of our work still has to continue. So, uh, so especially, uh, I want to welcome you. Uh, introduce the rest of the members of our team. Uh, Iris Taylor, Dr. Taylor is here. Uh, Lethea Carr, uh, Lisa Braddix, and of course, Devin, that we really count on to keep the process moving. So, again, uh, welcome. And uh, hopefully, we will. Uh, have some time at the end of the meeting for some announcements from, from you guys also. And if you have any comments, uh, first of all, if you're on the Zoom call, please put your name in the chat box so we know who's here. Uh, also, uh, if you have any questions or comments throughout the meeting, put them in the chat, bo chat box and we will respond to them uh, as we go through uh, the entire agenda. So again, uh, welcome our um, agenda uh, in addition to some updates our primary focus <clears throat> today will be on my aim and, uh, dr sokol and uh, gwendolyn norman is here to share that with you and the other primary focus will be again on issues around equity and uh, black women uh, women's health and alethea is going to lead us through that so before we get into those two main topics uh, Emily, are you on the line? I see your name. Yep, I'm here. Uh, Emily George from the Department of Health and Human Services is going to give us an update on COVID from MDHHS. Great. Thanks so much. Um, normally, Don Shanafelt gives the MDHHS updates, but she's not available today. So I am here. I'm happy to uh, join you all this afternoon. Um, and there's just a couple announcements that um, we'll go through today. So Devin, can you go to the next slide, please? Thank you. So um, wanted to share, kind of give a reminder of the stages that the governor has set um, as part of the um, reopening of the state plan or the safe start plan. Um, so it, we all had hoped, um, that we'd be moving to stage five, which you can see is basically, you know, everything would be opened with um, uh, giving a little bit more flexibility to this. Um, and she very well may do that. Um, there is, she has a scheduled press conference today, I believe it's at 3 p.m. So right after this meeting, this meeting wraps up. Um, but as you probably know, there's been some concerns. Um, there'll be some concerns about the numbers because um, of an incident that occurred in East Lansing. There, I believe it's now up to 107 cases are linked to exposure at Harper's, which is a, a bar, a restaurant bar in East Lansing. Um, so I think there's some concern about, um, you know, are we going to see an uptick in cases? Um, if you look on the website, um, and I can put the website in the chat box um, when I'm done here, um, but on the michigan.gov slash coronavirus webpage, there's a Michigan Safe Start map and it, and it gives some information there. And um, as of yesterday, they increased so I should back up a second. The map is risk areas. So it's not based on the stages that you see here, but on risk and low level risk, high level, moderate, 
um, medium high. Um, and so the Lansing area was increased to high risk um, and the Grand Rapids area was also increased to medium high risk. So um, we'll have to see what the governor has to say today about if we're going to move into stage five, if we're gonna stay um, in stage four for a bit longer. Um, he's also supposed to talk about um, what uh, the school reopening plan is going to look at in the fall. So for schools, um, what what they are suggesting or, or recommending or rolling out related to schools reopening um, in a couple months here. Um, Devin, can you go to the next slide? Oh, 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 Um, sorry, if anybody can mute themselves, I just muted everybody and Emily, you should be unmuted now. Okay, great. Thanks. Okay. Yeah, I, I think we're good now. Um, so just a couple other announcements. Um, you know, as we hear more about um, COVID response, obviously we'll pass all that information on. Um, but just a couple other MDHHS announcement or related announcements. So. Um, Hopefully you all know about the maternal infant health webpage um, that is associated with, with our division as well as the um, maternal infant health and equity improvement plan. Um, and you can see the web address there on the screen. Uh, we've recently added a health equity tab. So there's several tabs that you can access. There's one for the collaboratives, there's one um, for the MyHack meetings, and, and we've added a health equity tab. Um, my colleague Heather Boyd has worked really hard on that and has done a great job. Um, we have some other colleagues that helped pull some resources together um, to include on that, that tab. Um, so if you go there and you see something that's missing that you think belongs there, please feel free to send. Um, you can send me an email, you can send Dawn an email, and we'll make sure that. Um, we get that up there. So it's, it's pretty comprehensive, but we, we know that we don't have everything um, on there, but so please, we encourage you to take a look at, at those resources. And if, again, if you see something that's missing, um, please let us know. And then the last uh, announcement today is, um, hopefully you all know that the Maternal Infant Health Summit has been moved to September 22nd and 23rd. It's a virtual summit. Um, we're using a virtual platform. And please know that registration is open. Um, originally, when we were going to have an, the summit in person, um, the capacity was, was capped at about 500 people. Now that it is moved into a virtual platform, that capacity has greatly increased. So if you are interested in attending the summit, please do go and register. If you had previously registered for the summit, you should have received an email um, with instructions on um, re-registering. I think you got like a coupon code to use when you register, but you do need to re-register just given the different platform that we're, we're using now. Um, so you can visit the website that's linked, uh, that's listed there on the screen, the myhealthsummit.com. Um, and that has a link for registering. Um, as well as additional information about the summit. And that was all I have for today. Are there any questions? I know you're all muted, but. I'm gonna unmute folks, but if you could use the chat box too, that would be great. All right. Okay, while, while people are thinking about questions, I do have an uh, additional announcement. On uh, June the 19th, I uh, participated in a press conference along with uh, Michigan Black Lives Matter and the Michigan NAACP. And their goal, our goal, because being a part of that uh, partnership, is to have Michigan uh, designate racism as a public health uh, pandemic or a public health crisis. 
uh, I was on a panel and uh, the link to that panel was shared with you, I know earlier on that day by Dawn, as well as it's mentioned in the uh, maternal child health update you'll be getting from MDHHS uh, probably today or tomorrow because it just was issued uh, yesterday. <clears throat> At any rate, for that press conference, I was representing Black women leaders, Black women public health leaders who are also the mothers of Black sons. And I do have a Black son and uh, two Black grandsons. And that group uh, that I was representing was uh, or is Renee Kennedy. Uh, you guys know Renee, Cynthia Tag from Ascension Health, uh, Phyllis Meadows, who's now at Cresby, and uh, Loretta Bush, all having served as uh, local public health directors. And of course, I also served as a state health director. And I just want to share a couple uh, quotes that or statements that I made that have gotten some pretty good uh, distribution. Uh, and I think really lays the groundwork for public for racism as a public health crisis. Um, racism and inequities in housing, education, and the criminal justice system, in turn, led to poor health outcomes for Black Americans. If all lives matter, certainly all the data indicates that historically, Black lives have not mattered. Public health has not only the responsibility, but also the moral obligation to directly confront and provide the leadership to dismantle racism and the impact it has had on our nation's health, especially our African-American communities. We are done dying and we do wash our hands. So uh, you'll be hearing more about uh, the process that, that's going to be put in place to bring on other partners, uh, because uh, as you know, we've been dealing with the social determinants of health, all of which are emanating from uh, structural and systemic racism and the history of our country. So you'll be hearing a lot more about that. Uh, and again, my comments was not uh, representing Simquick or uh, GDAC, but uh, the group of us Black women who are public health leaders. But I'm sure I speak for many of you uh, that are on the call today, and you'll be hearing more. So are there any questions at all for, for me or for Emily? Did anybody put anything in the chat box? We will be sharing uh, the slides that you see today after um, our meeting is over. That was one of the questions that was uh, included. And I noticed that Emily has included the link to um, several references that she made during her presentation in the chat box as well. Yeah, the uh, link to the uh, press conference on uh, public health, on racism as a public health crisis. It's on the um, Michigan Black Lives Matter uh, Facebook page. Okay, with that, uh, why don't we move on to the environmental scan. Uh, Iris, you guys probably remember we've talked about that at about every meeting. Dr. Taylor? All right, good uh, afternoon, everyone. Uh, the environment, you know, first of all, let's just uh emphasize that any comments regarding this little short um request to get your uh feedback regarding our objectives for the 20 uh 21 year for simquick uh, i'd like you to uh put into the chat box for us um your feedback is critical as we decide how we're going to continue to support the mother infant health equity uh, improvement plan, which is a commitment that Simcord has to look at those six priorities that are listed in that plan and what are the activities that we might be able to engage in that will support the overall accomplishment or the intent that is designed in that plan. 
So the environmental scan, as you recall, is something that we did so that we could get a sense of what SimQuint was already doing that was in line with the plan. And in that, we also asked that you, <coughs> excuse me, we also asked that you would indicate what are some areas that you aren't doing, but that you would like to further explore. Uh, haven't uh, looked at those areas that we were thinking in terms of moving forward for the 2021 year, that under the health equity priority, that uh, the one that you selected that says assess, could you go to the next slide, Devin? Yep. It says assess unconscious bias and the providers who serve families and implement strategies to address that was not only something that was in line with um, the environment today and all of the events around social justice and how does the biases play out as an actual behavior that is reflective in the care that we deliver or the conversation that we have with those that we serve would be in line with something that we can continue to address in the 20 21 year. So out of the four uh, areas that you said you had an interest in us, what we were thinking we would move forward with is developing some strategies under the health equity priority, assess unconscious bias in providers who serve families and implement strategies to address that. And that becoming um, probably an ongoing set of strategies that would cross over as we look at supporting the My Aim uh, bundles uh, as one of the commitments from Synquet, that it would also support any other strategy within Healthy Baby at Home, uh, that our, our, our improvement plan um, project that we're currently engaged in, and so that this particular objective would really cross over in several segments of support and activities. So that's our thought. I'd like you to uh, put in the chat your comments around that um, to give us some feedback. Um, Alethea, is anybody saying anything right now that we need, would need to discuss in the chat box? Mm, My chat uh, box, for some reason, is not coming up. Yeah, not at this moment. Um, I will mention, though, um, semi-related, that uh, Christine Carroll mentioned that the Lewis, the state's Lewis Cass building has been renamed to Elliot Larson, to the Elliot Larson building. And so mm -hmm. um, that, um, we may want to keep that in mind as uh, meetings are being held in, in Lansing at MDHHS, uh, as well as other changes that are happening across the country with uh, renaming locations and uh, buildings uh, more appropriately. So unless there's any objections to this particular strategy or this particular suggestion of inclusion, uh, as we do the plan for 2021, we'll be coming back to SimQuick with the plan probably in our September meeting. Um, this would be among that, and we would start to, to look at, so what are the strategies that we would engage in that are supportive of this particular uh, priority of the overall uh, maternal infant health and equity uh, improvement plan? And that's all I have, Vern. Okay, okay, thank you, Alethea. <clears throat> now we're gonna move into our discussion <laughs> on uh, Michigan My Aim with uh, Dr. Sokol and um, Gwen Norman. And we're doing this because uh, not just here, but especially here in Southeast Michigan, uh, we know the issues that we're facing with uh, black maternal mortality and maternal mortality in general. Um, we know based on the uh, my aim where it has been fully implemented that there really is something that can be done about it. We do not have to see the statistics that we see uh, in our state uh, and locally. Uh, so my aim uh, is uh, 
already evidence-based and has been proven as effective. And Dr. Sokol and Gwen will go through some of that. We know some of you, meaning some of our hospitals participate and some don't, uh, but it is something that we want our entire SimQuick community to be aware of okay. uh, because we are all accountable and there are ways that we can all help prevent uh, maternal mortality, especially black maternal mortality. And we know the majority of black births are down here in region 10. So uh, uh, with that, I'm gonna pass it to Dr. Coco and to Norm. Let's see how's everything going. I am going we, to uh, put everybody on mute really quickly and I'm gonna host talking. And uh you can ask everyone to mute your question. All right, Dr. Sokol, you are unmuted, and I'm gonna unmute one here. Here we go. Um, One's gonna start. Yeah. Hi. Yes, this is Wendell and Norman, and I was just saying that I'm pleased to have the opportunity to address a condition that despite the urgency and necessary attention that we've been giving to COVID-19, that we still need to keep on our radar the condition and the concern about maternal mortality and morbidity. As most of you know, I'm Gwendolyn Norman, and I've worked in perinatal research for the past 30 years. I'm currently a research associate at Wayne State. I teach public health um, in the undergraduate program at public health. And I'm also working as a maternal child health consultant with Henry Ford Health System and the Department of Public Health Sciences. I also have been working with my aim uh, in their outreach for a while, and I'm taking on some additional responsibilities with this program. Um, most of you know Dr. Sokol, and I just wanted to say a couple words about him, which is really hard to do, but he's the um, distinguished professor of the Department of um, Aspectus and Gynecology. He's the former dean, the emeritus dean of the Wayne State University School of Medicine. He was the department chair for OBGYN and the Detroit um, Medical Center, and the director of the CS Mott Center for Human Growth and Development. He has um, published extensively on perinatal brain damage. He's authored over 1,600 publications and 400 referee papers. And currently, he chairs the Michigan Medical Maternal Mortality Committee, um, where he served for over 36 years. And he is the co-leader of the My AIM program, aimed at reducing, reducing maternal mortality and morbidity. Can we go to the next slide, please? Can we go to the next slide. Okay, so using the experience that we have, what we're, can we go? I'm sorry, we need to go back one. We want to address the issue of um, serious issue of increasing maternal mortality and morbidity, and this pub, public and private consortium is has the approach of doing a maternal mortality review and improving clinical practice and addressing social determinants of health. So we hopefully are here today to engage SimQuick and with my aim to actively work together to help patients and healthcare professionals and birthing institutions to reduce preventable maternal mortality, severe morbidity and disparity. Next please. So the problem, clearly, Every year, about 25 women in Michigan die from complications related to pregnancy or childbirth, but that's just the tip of the iceberg. For every woman who dies in childbirth, 100 more suffer severe life-threatening injury, infection, or disease, which is about 2,500 young women or mothers per year. Next, please. Yeah, uh, this is Bob, hi. Okay. Uh, this shows uh, exactly what was uh, said before. This is uh, maternal mortality from 2011 to 2015 through 15 by Prosperity Region in Michigan. And I put, you can see, we put an arrow here that there's a lot of this uh, that occurs in uh, Region 10. Um, Starting out with, uh, there's a total of 39 births um, in uh, over that period, maternal uh, pregnancy-related deaths, and there are, uh, if you subtract those, uh, that's 141 
other maternal deaths. Now, what's under the other? These are pregnancy associated, but not related specifically to being pregnant. But they include things like homicide, suicide, auto accidents, in particular, drug overdose, and death uh, related to that. Uh, you can see that there is spread around the state, but the, um, the number in Region 10 uh, is uh, a substantial hunk of the problem in the state, and it's overrepresented if you did this by uh, population. So that's what we want to talk about today. Next slide, please. This slide shows you uh, how we're doing in Michigan. You can see the uh, purple uh, line is our maternal mortality, pregnancy mortality in Michigan, and the line above it is national. So we're doing a little bit better than nationally. Uh, the leading causes, however, in Michigan are hemorrhage and hypertension, embolism, amniotic fluid embolism, infection, and exacerbation of existing chronic conditions. So those are the medical, uh, the medical causes. Next slide, please. Now, when we take a look at those that are reviewed by the Maternal Mortality Committee, uh, from 2011 to 15, uh, about 44% were determined to be preventable. And that means that the committee, uh, we've gone back, looked at all the medical records that we can get, gone back, uh, sometimes talked to uh, staff of uh, MDHHS, has talked to uh, some of the caregivers and the people in the hospitals. I can tell you that since we, along with CDC, have opened, have expanded our, um, the width of what we're looking at to include now more in terms of social determinants. Now, it's not everything. We can't do, uh, cure all of the problems by any stretch. But if there looks like, in a given case, there was a contribution to the death that could be related to something which could have been done something about, like uh, late prenatal care due to lack of transportation, stuff like that. We now are running a preventability, a potential preventability at around half of the pregnancy uh, related deaths. So that's gone up. Uh, next, please. My aim is part of a major national program, and here in Michigan, the MI is obviously Michigan, but my aim is a, a good name for what we're doing. We're trying to eliminate preventable pregnancy-related maternal deaths, severe maternal morbidity, about tenfold more common, and disparity. We'd like to reduce all of those to zero, if we could. Next. This uh, shows you uh, the one of the major reasons that uh, we're, Gwen and I are uh, presenting this today. Uh, the trick here is this is now morbidity rather than mortality, but it is as close to showing as clearly as possible what disparity is about as I can show you. Take a look at the bottom and take a look for year to year, you can see that the, the that deaths amongst African Americans, or excuse me, morbidity, severe morbidity for African Americans has in fact gone down some as it has for whites and Hispanics and Asians and Native Americans, but it remains approximately twofold more common. So this is by population, by pregnant women. So if our patient is African American, she has about twice the risk of developing severe morbidity as women of other ethnic and racial backgrounds. Next, please. Well, how's my aim organized? My aim 
uh, we started and we're one of the first seven states uh, to participate. We were invited nationally. We started in uh, November of uh, 15. I wrote a proposal to the program is overseen by ACOG, American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists. Uh, I looked at what we had going and rather than replacing and reinventing the wheel, did business with everybody that I, we could find who was in the business of reducing maternal mortality and morbidity. And we integrated uh, this new program into uh, Michigan Department of Health and Human Services as a coordinated program. Um, this is done almost entirely by volunteers. There is very little financial support. Dawn has been a good guy and has dumped in some positions, uh, parts of positions, like Emily, who spoke uh, earlier. Um, and uh, we've gotten some grants. I've written a few grants. Uh, the most recent one to bring in and support Gwen, as a matter of fact. But we've been doing this on a shoestring. Most of the people who are doing this, the physicians, nurses, are volunteers. Uh, we're doing it on a shoestring. It's, uh, one of my former partners used to say, off the side of the desk. Uh, our partners include uh, Michigan Health and Hospital Association. They do a lot of the data, the American College District, uh, AWAN, the nurses, uh, partnering with DHHS. Um, we have just two committees. It's a very flat organization. We have a steering committee, which takes a look and looks at what we're focused on policy and tries to be sure to keep things on track. And then the real work happens in an operations group, which includes uh, some of our physician and uh, nursing leadership, uh, Jody Jones from uh, the uh, Michigan section of District 5 of ACOG has been a key actor, and Mary Schubert, uh, who's the uh, A1 person and uh, nurse and is just wonderful. Uh, they run, those two run the operations committee. The data are managed by the state and by Michigan Health and Hospital Association using uh, facilities that were already uh, in place. And uh, this is support in kind. Uh, we work with hospitals and clinicians as well as governmental and not-for-profit agencies to apply research findings. So we have an evidence base to improve maternal outcomes. Next, please. This shows you this next slide. Shows you uh, some of our uh, partners. And I think I've got most of the uh, active ones uh, who put in uh, some in-kind uh, support uh, to uh, help get this job done. Next. We just released, and I think um, these were sent around to the uh, quality collaboratives around the state um, and uh, was uh, put together primarily by uh, Heather, who was uh, mentioned earlier, and myself. And it's a handbook. It will. We're going to print some up will fit into a pocket or a purse, uh, and it gives you a notion and a summary and uh, guidance to find more information about what my aim is doing. I'm going to give you a quick summary right now. Next, please. AIM is about maternal safety bundles, and these are a little bit like the checklist that uh, pilots use but they're focused under four headings. And what we're trying to do is to help hospitals and healthcare professionals not miss and have things streamlined so that they can, so that we can do it right every time. The first R is readiness, then rec recognizing what the problem, we know for instance with sepsis that one of the big problems are hemorrhage is one of the big problems is that it just does, it gets missed. It's not recognized early enough so that you can prevent further uh, bad outcomes. Then getting the right response to what the problem is. And finally, 
uh, reporting and uh, having um, systems learning so that we can do better uh, every time. There's one example here. This is uh, the one for hemorrhage. They all look the same. Next, please. We're working. I don't know what happened to the slide. Stuff got moved, but okay. Um, we are working on five areas we've been working on. There are two that we are doing specifically within using AIM mechanisms, my AIM mechanisms, and those are severe hypertension in pregnancy and the preeclampsia and obstetric hemorrhage, two of our biggest uh, pillars and causes of morbidity. We are partner, partnering with uh, others uh, and working along with them on three additional uh, issues, safe reduction of uh, primary cesareans, uh, which are in low risk uh, patients, that is called OBI. It is supported by Blue Cross Blue Shield and is headquartered at the University of Michigan, Dan Morgan. Uh, uh, I and others from my aim are on uh, his uh, advisory committee. The second is an ups of the, of the uh, related programs is our only real, at this point, upstream solution, which is called MICA. And what it's about is immediate postpartum uh, LARP, uh, long-acting reversible contraception, either intrusion device or implants, which then can provide pregnancies with short interpregnancy intervals, which are clear risk factor. Uh, to do this, we needed support from and received support from Medicaid, as well as Blue Cross Blue Shield, because we had to unbundle the, because it's expensive putting in intrusion devices, uh, for instance. Just the device costs $500, mainly because of medical legal risk. Um, and so we're working uh, on that. That is uh, going on in uh, some test hospitals around the state. And that also is led from the University of Michigan. And finally, uh, the obstetric care of women with opioid use disorder. Uh, OUD is a big problem here in Michigan. I can tell you uh, we've, we have a uh, paper that is in preparation right now based on uh, experience in our maternal mortality review committees that one in five pregnancy associated, not related deaths, but deaths during pregnancy that aren't you know, medically caused is related to opioid use disorder. Many of these are postpartum, is we lose Medicaid coverage, and so coverage for medically, medi medical assisted uh, treatment and MAT. And uh, one in five, that is a lot, and it is not going down, and it is moving. It started out in rural areas, mainly a problem of uh, white Americans. It has become now. Uh, non-denominational and uh, has moved into cities. Now, there have always been substance use disorder uh, problems in urban areas, including uh, methamphetamine, cocaine, crack uh, in particular. But the state has got lots of programs uh, going on in that. So we made the decision not to get in the way, but to affiliate uh, via uh, Dawn, in fact, Dawn has been very active in this area. Next, please. Is that the next one? I think there's one back. Nope, okay. I, uh... This shows you how we've been doing. And what this does is show you our rates of severe maternal morbidity, which is a defined by specific codes as specified by CDC. So it allows national uh, uh, comparisons across time and uh, state to state. And you can see this looks at before we started my aim and then the last two quarters. And it shows you that we have had improvements in 
severe maternal morbidity ranging from about 10 to 25 percent. Those are big changes. So we believe that what we've been doing and and the learning that's gone on by our health care professionals and our delivering hospitals, delivery hospitals, there are 80 in the state, has in fact helped. But the bundles really do make a difference. But I have the next slide. Now, this shows you where we're going. We are, we've been in business now for uh, hmm, four and three quarter years. And it's, we need to do some new things and to add. And we've chosen two, quote, new, unquote, because they're not new problems, but two new safety bundles. The first is reduction in peripartum racial and ethnic disparities. And the second is sepsis. Next slide, please. This shows you that we have a ways to go. This looks at structural measures in our delivering hospitals. And you can see this just looks at um, hemorrhage and hypertension and what the percent of the bundles that our hospitals have managed to implement. And you can see there's nothing at 100%. The highest is around short, short of 80%. And the lowest is about a half. So even in the bundles we've been working on, we're far from complete uh, implementation. Implementation is very hard. And we're now gonna try two more. Next, please. This shows you severe morbidity, maternal morbidity across all the 80 birthing hospitals in the state. And there are some hospitals that have lower than average morbidity for the state. And those are the ones, the pink ones on the right. And there's some hospitals on the left, which have much higher than average for the state, severe maternal morbidity. We have shown you the eight hospitals or the top 10% in severe morbidity and the lowest 10%. And I put the arrow there as to at the high end. Of the eight hospitals, would anybody take a guess as to how many of the eight are in region 10? You can unmute or put fingers up or something. Or you can chat it in. Huh? Well, I can tell you. Of the eight oh, hospitals. I'm sorry. They're chatting the responses to the chat box. Vast majority, all, all. Okay, I can tell you it's five of the eight for the state. And you saw the proportion of mortality in region 10 and thus very likely morbidity. That's what this shows. So we have work to do in region 10. Now, it does not mean that the hospitals are bad because this is not risk adjusted. Let me ask another question. In of the hospitals with high severe morbidity, compared with those with the lowest severe morbidity, what do you think the difference is in their patients by way of proportion African-American? Well, I think uh, given that everybody's muted, I think I can just tell you. In the hospitals that have high morbidity, 
rates. 61% of the patients who receive care are African American. In the other hospitals that have the lowest rates of severe morbidity, including one, by the way, in uh, Wayne County, it's 2.8%. That's a 20 fold difference. So if you want an example of disparity and our need to deal with disparity, I don't know that I can think of anything much more telling than this. We have the next slide. I think, uh, Glenn, is this the one you take over on or do I do this one? I can, I can go ahead. So okay. our, um, and I just wanted to make a comment on what Dr. Sokol just said, because it's really important that we, for the hospitals where we're seeing higher rates of maternal, maternal morbidity, we do not want to say, well, okay, that's, that's a problem in that community. We want to, with true equity, every hospital should have excellent outcomes. And that means that we need to concentrate our resources in those areas where we're having the, the um, poorest outcomes. So we don't want to sit and say, well, this is a higher risk population. So that's why it's not an excuse. It's a call to action. So um, the current my aim activities will be what we discussed our webinars and the summit. We're going to be adding the two safety bundles that he just discussed, the disparity um, and sepsis, and also working to provide data. This is one area that I'm going to be working with, is including looking at the trends uh, to my aim and our hospital dashboard, starting with those with the highest severe maternal morbidity. And we do have to understand that when we're looking at morbidity and we're looking at decreasing um, the outcomes, whether it's pregnancy related, which are those medical conditions, the um, hemorrhage, sepsis, embolism, or pregnancy associated that often are, that can be related to accident or homicide or suicide, what we do to address those um, pregnancy related and pregnancy associated are, um, are highly correlated. So um, the other thing we want to do is to have individual ongoing meetings with hospitals as needed, and we're going to reach uh, out to the regional um, perinatal quality improvement coalitions. Uh, next slide, please. In terms of our racial disparities, Miami and the, steering, the Miami steering and operations teams are going to be working to complete implicit bias training provide implicit bias training for all of the Miami hospitals and their healthcare professionals and focus on efforts on highest risk women to reduce the black white disparity. Next. Yeah, um, I might add, I, I might yes. add to that, that there is it's a two prong mm -hmm. approach. We're going to, there is evidence that there are, you can choose it is implicit bias will be is necessary to do and we will be doing it we're uh, the state has a bunch of programs out there everybody on the maternal mortality committees we just made it policy and uh, who works on my aim is going to do uh, some pretty extensive uh, training in implicit bias so that we then can go out and work with our birthing hospitals with the physicians, nurses, and staff uh, there. But that's not enough because there are real medical reasons in addition that really need to be dealt with. And there is pretty good evidence that it is not everybody who is, say, Afri is minority, African-American, Hispanic, American mm -hmm. Indian, who uh, has trouble. It is those that have additional risk factors, comorbidities. So we need to work out a way to get our caregivers to focus, particularly for those patients and watch them and treat them with uh, better, if you will, uh, because they are the ones who are at risk for mortality and severe morbidity. 
So that's, uh, I'm working with a, a professor uh, named uh, Lindsay Adlin, uh, who uh, was uh, one of the uh, prime authors on uh, those studies. And we're going to try to be applying that as well to work on uh, disparity. Uh, yeah, let's do any questions and answers. We are. Uh, before we <clears throat> get into question and answers, um, I just wanted to mention to Gwen, or to all of you all, that statement, uh, not an excuse, but a call to action, uh, is really important because we know that this is not easy. This is hard. Uh, we know that if we don't make these changes here in Region 10, the state is not ever going to have the numbers that they want. But we are less concerned about the numbers than we are about uh, more concerned about the individuals and particularly the black women uh, who are dying that is preventable and we are focusing on preventable deaths. So I just wanted to stress that that real challenge for us here in Region 10, but it is our problem, uh, not just a state problem or just not a problem with the data that might be reported. So I just kind of wanted to get out there for our questions. Uh, we would be very interested in hearing from uh, some of the hospitals that actually are engaged in my aim. Uh, you know, what are some of the issues? What what do we need to do better or more to get more hospitals? We have what have fifty two birthing hospitals in in Region Ten. Eighty, 80 birthing hospitals. How many? Eighty. Eighty. Yeah. Wow. Eighty in the state. We've lost two in the last few years which were rural hospitals which is a, a big problem but there are 80. thank you we have 80 birthing hospitals in southeast michigan and those of you that deliver the majority of births african-american births you know who you are so uh with that uh we can open it up to some discussion and, and feel free to just turn your mic off and talk uh i think that's better than just jotting something on the chat on the chat list. and i just wanted to clarify that it's 80 in the entire state yeah oh, okay. we have 20 22 in, in region 10. we do have a couple of um people that have chatted in uh questions one is from uh dr holtrup do we understand what keeps hospitals from implementing the bundles let me let me take a crack at that to some extent, yes. Uh, however, there is very little evidence based on why that is. Most of it's observational, and that's because implementation science is a new science. I can tell you, I have spent my career 50 years uh, trying to improve care in OBGYN. And the hardest part is not doing the research. The hardest part is applying what we know and actually getting it applied and getting people to do it. And that's known. We've known, uh, we have people here who know about neonatal nursing. We knew for years, it took 15 years to apply what we know about oxygen and causing blindness in kids to get the oxygen turned down in neonatal nurseries. So implementation is a big problem. Policies and procedures help, but they also hinder because it's really hard to change them once they're in place. Habit, missing things. A lot of it is that women bleed out postpartum. We had one this year here in Michigan, a woman who died in the hospital, postpartum <laughs> ward, and just led to that, wasn't noticed. So <clears throat> implementation is difficult and we, uh, I am currently sitting on a dissertation in implementation science, one of the only programs in the country at the University of Michigan. And we are going to be looking at exactly that question. She is gonna be looking Mm -hmm. uh, sitting in on uh, some of the uh, work that's being hosted by Michigan Health and Hospital Association. It is a great question. 
if we knew more about why implementation is so hard, we could improve what we're doing. So we are, we are open to any ideas. <laughs> One of the things that would help is getting quality collaboratives, it depends, they're called different things in different parts of the state, to involve, to bring uh, people, it's, it's not just the hospitals, we need people to be aware of this. So they ask if their hospitals are doing these things. Uh, and it's the, the healthcare providers, it's the executives, the hospital executives. We have a hospital, we have a hospital system here in Michigan where almost everybody who was doing quality improvement was let go. It was a budget problem. Wow. That's a disaster. Yeah, I, I see that uh, Jennifer Thompson Wood did offer uh, on the chat <clears throat> to provide uh, some technical assistance for any hospitals that have challenges with data collection and submission uh, to my aim. So uh, Jennifer, uh, thank you for that. You wanna make any comment out loud here? Uh, hi, thank you for inviting me to the meeting. Um, Devin had sent me the invite um, via Mary Schubert. We have been working on my aim since the, at Barrow Hospital in Lansing since the beginning in 2015. And we have worked quite hard on our data process. We do have EPIC, so if you are another hospital with EPIC, that does make it easier to share our information, but we are happy to meet with anyone who uh, wants to look at how to improve um, collecting of, you know, collect specifics on collecting data and submitting into the AIM um, database. There's also information on the My AIM website about submitting the data if you uh, want to glance at that as well. And I didn't say we have uh, monthly webinars, which often give our hospitals an opportunity to exchange information. There's a, there's a lot to the program that we haven't been able to talk about today. We unfortunately don't have money to pay somebody to collect the data in each hospital. Mm -hmm. and like I said, I, I'm working on this probably 30, 40 hours a week, basically for free. Oh, basically. That's a huge problem. Uh, and that the data collection and submission is separate from the care you give, but it's just such a major piece that without it, you don't, you don't even know if you have results. Uh, was there another uh, comment or question here? Byrne, there were a couple of other comments earlier. Um, oh. One was from M Emily Narrator. I don't know if she wants to mention it, but she noted that a uh, course on unconscious bias is offered at Henry Ford Health Systems. I don't know if she wants to say more about that. Oh, sure. Th this is Emily. Um, I've taken the class. Um, Jan Harrington uh, teaches the class. She's one of our HR uh, VPs. Um, and it's offered to everyone uh, uh, in the system. I think eventually the goal was to make it uh, a required class, uh, but it's it's a really good uh, reflection of your own thoughts and you know kind of opening up your mind to it. Uh, so I just wanted to make the group aware of that. Okay, thank, thank you. you. You're welcome. Dr. Holtrip also um, noted that a 21 day challenge um, is available. I don't know if you want to talk about it, uh, Teresa, but uh, it's called 21 Day Racial Equity Habit Building Challenge. And um, she might want to say more about that. So actually, this was sent to, can you hear me? Yes. OK. Um, this was actually sent to me by the um, National AAP Section on Minority Health Equity and Inclusion. Um, I'm on their list serve. And um, it was a, a it's a free syllabus um, that was put out by the I think by, I think by the American Bar Association, 
and I, I don't know much about it, but um, one person commented as a, a pediatrician in uh, California who is of Japanese um, American descent. And he says, we are in the middle of doing this syllabus. A subgroup of us in our academic primary care practice meet twice a week in the evening for one hour to group process the reading. We started about one week after the start of the challenge, and we've been doing one assignment per day. The readings and podcasts and TED Talks are all really compelling and fit nicely with each other. An important aspect is that if you decide to assemble a group, it be a safe place to explore together thoughts and feelings that come up. It's an amazing syllabus because it touches upon so many things and resonates in so many ways such that I'm hoping we will come together and come up with a local and sustainable action step. So he's from the University of California in San Francisco. Um, I don't I, I don't know anything further about it, but it, it seems like it might be a very practical kind of a thing that people might want to take a look at. I guess I might add that Don Schoenfeld has put together, and maybe uh, Emily George is still on the call, uh, a listing of available resources. I think it includes the Henry Ford one uh, that are available right here uh, in Michigan and uh, readily available for use. I do think that this is an idea whose time is certainly come. Yeah, I see we got a comment from uh, Kara from the March of Dimes uh, that mm -hmm. says that they run uh, implicit bias training demos every Tuesday from noon until one. So uh, I think what we're saying is that uh, MDHHS, hopefully, I didn't, I wasn't aware, but you know, we need to consolidate these resources in a way. Uh, that they're easily available and that people will know that they're there. And um, we might want to think a little more about that because one of our goals, as I mentioned, as uh, really Iris mentioned, um, for 2021 is to uh, dig deeper into, uh, and what we're calling it is a uh, equity network for uh, Region 10 where these resources could be collated uh, in a way that they can be accessible and easily used by our uh, organizations here, as well as uh, shared in ways that uh, sometimes we do things more competitive than we do collaborative. But this is an issue that we must collaborate on. And SimQuick, uh, we know that we can play a stronger role than we have been in the past. I'll, I'll put a note on my agenda for I have a, a bi-weekly discussion with Dawn. And I'll put a note to ask her to get it to you, get the list to you. I, I don't know if it's complete yet, but one way or another, you'll get it. Thank you. We've got uh, quite a few good comments here. Uh, we don't have time to go over all of them, so check them out. But what we will be doing <clears throat> uh, following this is having a my aim. Uh, discussion or on the agenda at every one of our meetings uh, so we can better monitor our progress. And we will be including uh, in more detail in our own work plan for Region 10 uh, what it is we hope to get uh, accomplished with, uh, with my aim. So uh, with that, thank you, uh, Dr. Sokol. We go a long way back. Both of us had black hair when we first met. Uh, and of course, as long as one and I go back. <laughs> and uh, thank we've got you some so excellent, much for the invitation. Really appreciate it. Excellent comments here, and I can assure you uh, that we will be following up. So even though we're moving on to the next topic, if you have some thoughts that you need to add to the chat, and we're going to be reviewing the chat to be sure that we try and get to every question uh, before our meeting is over. So thank you, thank you again. This has been extremely helpful. And uh, we're gonna really see what we can do to make a difference down here in Region 10, uh, not just with my aim, but the uh, preventable deaths for uh, African-American women specifically. Okay, wanna, um, the Toxic A Black Woman Story. Uh, it's a, a video that Alethea and I saw uh, when we were at the, uh, 
at a Cleveland conference on racism, uh, supported by video is supported by the March of Dimes. Thank you, Kara, uh, for for making it available. And with that, um, I think you guys will find this video uh, extremely compelling and definitely worthy of discussion. So with that, I'm gonna just pass it to Alethea uh, to, to introduce them and get us moving. Thanks, Vern. Um, yeah, as you mentioned, we um, saw the video toxic when we were in Cleveland and thought it would be an excellent one to share here with our membership. Um, and we're really happy that we, we have finally uh, have access to it. Um, when you received the agenda for this meeting, we shared three pre-screening questions. And hopefully you had a chance to look at them. And if not, take a few minutes right now. Actually, these are, there are four questions. Uh, take a look right now. And I want you to take one minute to chat in your responses to these four questions. One, for those on the phone, is there an opportunity to increase your colleagues or staff understanding of implicit bias in your agency? From what we've heard already this morning, it seems like there are many venues where that exists, but I wanna see your response. Um, what are some of the daily stressors pregnant and working women experience? The third is, do you think Black women have experiences that put their babies at greater risk during pregnancy? And for number four, what might be some of those experiences and risk factors? And um, just list one or two that come to mind. And then we're going to go into the uh, actual screening of the video. I think you're going to find it um, quite interesting and useful. But as you look at it, not only look at it for the content, but think about how, uh, if there is an opportunity for you to use a video like this in your work setting or um, in the group that you, you oversee, think about how you might use that. Okay, uh, and as Vern said, um, this video was sponsored by March of Dimes, but also First Year Cleveland and um, the YWCA of Greater um, Cleveland. So with that, I'm going to ask Devin to start the video. Yeah, sure. Just a little heads up for everybody due to the technology. It's going to have a slight delay on it, but you'll be able to hear and see things. So. Um, if you have any questions afterward about it, please just feel free to reach out to me or uh, Fern or Alethea, and we'll be happy to answer any questions. We're going to revisit these questions after you look at the video. So that there is a, a method to this, uh, to uh, respond these uh, questions, responding to these questions. Okay, thanks, Devin. Okay, thank you, Devin. Yeah, thank you. Uh, wraps it up for us. Um, let's open the lines because I I'd really be interested to hear even before we get into the questions, um, but as you read through them, if that if it helps you to respond to them, that's fine. But I, I'd like to hear comments about your um, impressions of the video. Hi, uh, this is Gwendolyn Norman, okay. and um, I, go ahead, Gwen. I'm getting some kind of feedback. One of the things that I think about this film is to be called toxic, is because all women experience stress, but the stress related to racism is different and has a particularly toxic effect on on people. Thanks, Glenn. Devin, maybe to um, reduce the echo, we'll mute everyone and if you'll just unmute yourself 
when you're ready to speak. That might help. Thanks, Gwen. I think that's right on target. Um, you know, from the video, there was there were examples both uh, on the job as well as um, within the community, as well as in that on that national scene, and that um, is highlighted throughout the video as an example of what African Americans deal with on a daily basis. Um, Dr. Holtrup, do you want to unmute? Yeah. Yep. I see your chat, yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> you want to add anything to that? Well, I just, I, I, I at one point was like, I got to walk away from this because every single thing that this mom, ex this woman experienced was so believable. And so I've seen it and, you know, when it, when you pile it all together and you can just see how this can happen, um, it, 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 it's just, it's very painful to watch and, and yet real. Thank you. Cheryl, would you like to, um, I see you, you think it's a great film. You want to add anything to that? Hi. Um, yes, I think it, um, as I said in my comment, it hit on multiple layers of stressors, including life stressors at home, um, stressors in raising your children, stressors when you um, see a provider and you're not heard, stressors of, of what your child experiences um, at school and trying to, trying to protect your child. Um, and it just hit on so many different things um, that, that in in seeing the the mom and the family in this, you know, I can relate to every single aspect of of her um, experiences, except for in in my case during my pregnancies, I didn't have that um, sense of not being heard. Uh, but was it is it because I am already in the OB field? I don't know. Um, however, it, it just really, I could, it, I really resonated with the experiences that were displayed in the film. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Lee Griffith, are you able to comment at all? I saw your chat. Um, yeah, I, I think, uh, can you hear me? Yes. I, I think oftentimes people feel that black women die at higher rates or have more severe mortality or morbidity, excuse me, um, because of uh, resources and lack of transportation and other issues. But but higher socioeconomic status or education is not protective. Um, and it, it lends itself to all the stresses of being an African-American woman pregnant um, even if you have money, right? And even if you have education, you're still not protected from the stresses of racism. So um, to echo what Cheryl said, uh, for me, I experienced all of those things, including my birthing experience at a Southeastern Michigan hospital uh, as a physician, as a black woman physician. So, um, so it's very powerful because it sends the message that, you know, I think some people think, well, it's because uh, black women, you know, have more hypertension or black women, have more uh, diabetes or black women have more obesity. And I think the film highlights her, um, you know, her story in a different way that's, um, that's impactful. So thank you for sharing it. Thank you. Um, Rhonda Daly, Dr. Daly, are you still on? Yes, I am. Yeah, Hi, can you, you hear me? Here? Yes. Um, um this film was painful to look at i can relate to a lot of things that that person has gone through and um this is what my team focuses on um which is the biological and social um stresses related to preterm birth um and we look at all of these things related and um, not only to um the health um, aspect as far as chronic disease, but also psychosocial neighborhood factors, racism, relationship stress, all of these stressors play a huge role in um, how the woman feels throughout pregnancy. Let um, Taking pregnancy aside, you know, black women experience a lot of stress anyway, but with an added pregnancy, it does affect the baby. Um, I, I'm pretty sure it does. 
but this film really does put it in a nice way, in a sense that um, it's showing that even women, of course, in all socioeconomic statuses, they experience these stresses. And of course, um, like Dr. Holtrip said, I think that's what her name is, um, she, she mentioned that, um, uh, that um, income does not really um, account for that or cover that at all. And we see that a lot with Black women. So I, I love the film, it was good. Nafisha, do you want to expand on your comment? I, I hear the common theme uh, from many that the film is hard to watch, but it's short enough. It's a, just under 30 minutes um, that it it can be watched in its, it, in its entirety and then um, have some discussion afterwards. Nafisha, do you want to uh, expand? Yeah, I'll I'll go ahead and add to that. Um, I pretty much agree with what everyone else has said, and I think when we talk about in terms of the mortality rate amongst the clients, and for those of you who don't know me, I work for Ascension in our MIHP program, and it made me think about the clients who get late prenatal care or don't get prenatal care at all, and one of the things we often ask is why, and you hear so many of them with so many horror stories about not feeling heard or they've heard from other people. And so they'd much rather not even go into a physician's office until it's close to delivery. And so we know that when that happens, there are so many other things that can go that can be going on at that time that puts them at a higher risk. But they'd rather risk that than to go into an office where someone is demeaning, condescending or just outright don't care about what their concerns are. So I think, like everyone else has said, it affects us in a multitude of ways. And there are so many different things that planned out in that one video. I'm sure we could have a week discussion on all the microaggressions, all the other things that are going on in the video, from the interaction with the people outside of the store, from the interaction with the man that worked at her son's school, and how we talk about stressors and how all of that plays a factor into, you know, a woman being pregnant. And our lives matter in a sense that, you know, we have so many other things going on outside of a pregnancy. And that's the main focus that we try to teach our physicians and our nurses that, yeah, maybe mom isn't coming to her prenatal appointments or not going to the test in which you're offering, but she needs other support to help with those other things that has that she has going on that ultimately determines whether or not she has a healthy outcome. And so that's what we continue to try to do. But yeah, the film was hard to watch, but it's absolutely necessary in today's time with the mortality rate significantly increasing as we speak. Thank you, thank you. Dr. Pat, you've uh, added in several comments. You wanna add anything to them? Dr. Ferguson. Yeah, can you hear me? I'm trying to unmute. I don't know if. Uh, oh, okay, we hear you. We hear you now. Yes. Okay, I um, tried to keep them the answers to the questions as they popped up concise, but I just think what everybody else has said sums it up. I mean, we have our personal anecdotal stories that parallel, but I, I think one of the issues is that there is the opportunity to have the uncomfortable conversations is commonplace now, but the determining factor that I've seen and every time the question has been asked in those conversations is what has been done, what action steps are in place, usually there aren't any. So although we understand all of these issues, how do we implement action steps that actually have consequences when these acts continue to occur and how do we empower women of color and their families to address them in a non-confrontational way but that gets impact so i think the film is a great first step it's just like what's the what's the next step and how do we implement actions good point point. and this um, is Gwendolyn norman and i just wanted to respond to that because this film um, I'm working on a pro working towards a project now that has to do with dealing with not just implicit but explicit bias because it can't be a one-way training where we teach the care providers how we want them to to perform and not equip women 
on how to deal with those issues, not just the microaggressions, but being disrespected, and how to and um, to kind of arm them with an arsenal when they're going in. I hate to use arsenal because it sounds so military, but uh, uh, have a toolkit so that they can, when they go in for care, they know which questions to ask and they know when um, and know how to detect when maybe the responses are not in their best interest. But I think that this film, I agree with everyone else, it's very painful to watch. It almost brought tears, but um, it's something that we have to deal with. Um, Lakeisha? Lakeisha Grant. Hello. Hi, we hear you. So, um, I, you know, I'm going to always go back to the thing that we need do look um, someone that I feel like the women that I serve, I work at Focus Hope. Um, I'm a lead home based teacher. Um, I think that they are not um, educated on um, a lot of different health challenges. So they come back and they ask us questions that we turn around and say, you have to talk to your provider about it. Sometimes they do, sometimes they don't. Um, I just think that we need someone that could be there for mom and also there for the doctor. So being that person, the goal in between person, um, that maybe to remind um, the moms. And then when it comes to the implicit bias, um, I also believe training should be start in school. So like at the um, college level and, and continued in the workplace. So that's just my thoughts. Thank you, Lakeisha. You also mentioned um the advantage of having a doula. And I think it was um, Andrea mentioned uh, home visiting as uh, mm -hmm. another support that might be useful. Um, I think we have a couple of more comments. And then I just wanted to wrap up with um, some thoughts about if you think you can use this film in your organization, how, and um, just to think about what you might want to do with it. Jay, did you have anything you wanted to add to your comment? You talk about the superwoman schema, and we all tend to fall into that. Do everything for everybody. Yeah, it's a part of um, Black feminist theory, or womanism, as they call it, but that superwoman schema with the kind of irony of fully stepping into the space of trying to be everything for everyone, especially for men in our lives, mm -hmm. um, particularly particularly our sons and our husbands. And, you know, you can see in the video, people were offering her husband and her son offering her help or, and her refusing, kind of diminishing what she really needed. And it's ironic because as strong as she is for everyone else, the, the times where she should have you know, really been that vigilant and assertive for herself on her own behalf. She allowed herself to shrink in those spaces and not demand better care or take her own needs more seriously. Right. I, I, I noticed when her husband asked her to pick the kid up and she said, didn't I already tell you I had a really stressful and long day today? Mm -hmm. said, oh, she said, no, no, I'll do it. Like, no, you won't. <laughs> right, right, right. Yeah, thank you for everyone's comments. Um, the pre-questions and the post-screening questions were provided as part of the package that comes with the video. And as I said uh, when I started, I not only wanted to show the video as um, a possible uh, tool that you may want to use, but to share the share it as a product that you may want to use in your organization. It includes questions that can be used with staff or colleagues um, to uh, generate discussion about what's being portrayed in the video, and it, it can uh, be used with the general audience, um, health and or service, uh, social service providers, as well as educators and advocates or impacted families. So it can be used with several different audiences. Um, 
It includes 14 call to action steps. And I heard um, a couple of people talk about the need to take that next step and look at, okay, we, we see the issues, we see the problems. So what else can we do to change this situation? to really address what we've been seeing and talking about over time that is impacting uh, African-American women and, and the outcomes of their babies, of their pregnancies. Um, uh, Kara mentioned um, to contact her if you're interested in um, having the video, using the video in your organization. She includes her contact information. Yeah, she includes her um, email to uh, get a hold of her. There's a minimal charge for it. But um, when we viewed it, we really were um, very impressed with what's here because as was noted, it includes uh, microaggressions as well as those in, um, the overt aggressions that happen um, to black women every day that um, you know we go through. So um, again, thank you very much for your comments. Um, I want to make sure that I'm mis mentioning everything that uh, we have here. It's short enough to be, you know, to really be effectively used as part of a um, staff meeting or, you know, or a separate um, time so, to focus on health equity. Right. Please let us know also. Uh, contact Kara. Please copy us so we can keep a track. I yes. know which ones of our uh, organizations are using the film. Uh, like Alethea said, there is a small charge. Um, I don't know, Kara, if you want to comment on that, but uh, we will be looking yeah. at ways, as well as the state, to support financially those organizations that could not afford to charge. Kara, you want to make some comments? Go ahead. Yeah. Sorry. Sure, yeah, no, um, we purchased just a small license. Um, we couldn't afford the, the one for, um, the, it was like 500 beyond um, employees, but it, it was very small. We purchased for $250. We could um, have a copy of the video and we can share it with our partners. Based on the license, I can't then give it to partners to spread widely. But if you want to share it, you know, much like we did here, if you want to share it with your staff, um, I can partner with you, you know, to to share the share the film. Um, but if you're going to use it more widely and want to use it freely and get the um, discussion guide and, and all of that, it, it can be $250, um, depending on the size of your company. But if I if that is, you know, a barrier, I want to help you however I can so reach out to me by email and i'll see how we can how we can fix the issue um one thing i want to mention i see we're running out of time uh is that and i know everybody noticed that the uh the shooting they were referring to was the shooting of tamir rice uh, who was a 12 year old on a playground playing with a toy gun that was killed and there was no accountability or charge uh, to the officer or officers that did that shooting. And she was saying, not right now, not right now, I just can't handle it. If you would take that and multiply that about, I don't know, a hundred times for what African Americans are feeling right now uh, with the shooting of the murder of, uh, of George, you know, Floyd. And uh, right after that, there was another one. And right before that was another one. And speaking for myself as an African American, as a mother, you know, and grandmother of a, you know, black family, black sons, uh, every time I see that, it's like a knife, you know, that goes into my heart. Uh, and uh, just as a people, and, and I, I don't, I'm not saying this doesn't affect people that are not African Americans, but I can certainly say as a people, as an African American, it's just a very, very stressful time. And I can, can more than relate to the black women who uh, are pregnant and are dealing with many more stresses than I would, or even this mother 
I think this film was great in that, you know, socioeconomic status does not protect you from the pain and the uh, the outcomes of uh, racism, both uh, structural, systemic, in our community, uh, even though we're pretty much talking about in the health system. And everybody is uh, talking about implicit bias training. But as we think about the training, we need to think about what is the next step for accountability? And what is the training supposed to result in? And how do you know it happened? And what else do you need to do to be sure that the training has an outcome? And, and how is that going to be measured? How are we all going to hold ourselves accountable? Uh, training is, is, a, is a good first step, but it's really only a first step. Uh, and I, I just wanted to, uh, I think it was uh, Lakeisha to say that it needs to be in schools. It's just not enough to wait until now you're a healthcare provider, now you learn about implicit bias. You know, we got to back that back that up some more. So, uh, those are just some of my uh, comments. Every time I see the film, I get tears, and this is about the third or fourth time I've seen the entire film because I so relate uh, to to Nina, uh, the lady in this film. So it is around two fifty six, close to three. Um, are there any announcements that anybody uh, would like to make? or uh, just kind of add on here. I just want to reiterate what Vern said in terms of letting us know if um, you decide you want to use this vid toxic video, uh, because it does help us to get a sense of whether our efforts to make these kinds of tools available um, is what you're looking for and helps to uh, better address health equity in our region. And I have a is, question. This, go ahead. Sorry. Sorry. Who, who sorry. This, this, is, this is Teresa Holstrom. Um, I have a question. I would be very interested in possibly using this with an audience of pediatric residents, even though it deals more with an OBGYN um, scenario. Um, is does do you know of anybody who has done that and and how did that go? No, you're, you're asking able to address that, but I'm sure effective. Yeah, Carol, I would think. Yeah, yeah. I don't know. Of, I don't know what specific groups have used it just yet, but I know that it was created for that purpose. You know, to educate, not just providers, but to educate the community at large. So I think it would be fantastic. If I can help you share that, let me know. Okay. Yeah, I, I, good for community at large also, not just uh, providers for pregnant women, for example. Uh, it would be very reaffirming for them uh, also. Did I hear another announcement or comment? Um, as far as next steps for us, we mentioned that uh, we're working on putting our 2021 uh, plan together. And uh, we definitely, as SimQuick, uh, depending on the amount of additional resources we're able to get, but it is our intent uh, to put together within SimQuick uh, resources and also to be able to provide some level of technical assistance, which we aren't staffed to do that uh, right now but also some level of uh, technical assistance for, for any of our agencies and to really organize the resources in a way, because uh, sometimes you can just get so many, it's even hard to choose which one. Sometimes it's good to have some discussion with someone about what your goals are and who your audience is and some input as to which of all these resources might work best for you. So uh, we'll be coming back to this uh, in a major way um, and we know that our SimQuick goals uh, is only going to be uh, really reached <clears throat> if we're able to make a greater impact on uh, Black infant mortality, Black uh, maternal mortality, and uh, you know all of the uh, issues around that, which a major one, of course, is uh, racism and its impact. 
So with that, Alethea, Iris, you guys uh, have anything you want to add? I think good? I'm good. Okay, so thanks everybody. We're right on time. And feel free to follow up with if you have any additional thoughts with any emails or uh, comments. So again, thank you. Our next meeting is September uh, 15th, but uh, we'll be busy working uh, during the next couple of months getting ready for the fall.